So you've probably seen by now what happens when you put a coil of wire in a magnetic field. If I have a couple bar magnets whose north and south poles are arranged as such, and we take a loop of wire, and we're trying to draw a three-dimensional drawing here, but I think you can pick up on what I'm drawing. This is a loop of wire that's sitting in a horizontal plane. And if I identify the positive and negative terminals of that loop, then we're certain in what direction the current is flowing. So the current would flow uh, in a counterclockwise direction when viewed from above. So let's figure out in what direction this loop of wire is going to spin. And remember, this is basically the explanation of why the armature in a DC motor spins around, right? So that could be the um, axis of rotation. So we're just going to use the right-hand rule. If we have a current flowing into the page in this segment of wire, and it's in a magnetic field that points to the right, then based on the right-hand rule, if your thumb points into the page and your fingers point toward the right, then you find your palm points down. And so there's a force down on that segment of the wire. The current turns the corner over here. And now we've got a current coming out of the page. So you point your thumb out of the page. And you still point your fingers to the right. So with your thumb out of the page and your fingers to the right, you find that this segment of wire gets forced up. And because those forces each have a lever arm, then there's a net torque. And this loop is going to spin in a clockwise direction. OK. So the question is, what happens when the loop of wire is in a vertical orientation instead of a horizontal orientation? In other words, what if I have the segment of wire this way? So maybe this is the positive and this is the negative. Now, when viewed from this side, uh, that person would see a clockwise flow of current. In any case, if current is flowing into the page in a magnetic field that points to the right, then uh, again, point your thumb into the page, point your fingers to the right, and there'd be some downward force. And if you follow the same logic for the part of the current that's flowing this way, there's an upward force. In this case, there's no lever arm for the two forces, so they cancel each other out. Not only is the net force zero, but the net torque is also zero. And what happens is this loop would just get uh, compressed, right? There'd be a force squeezing in this way and a force squeezing in this way, and there'd be a tendency to uh, compress in on this loop, and it would have no tendency to spin. And interestingly, if you had brushes that were contacting the motor, if this piece of wire was connected to that half of the part of the metal we called the commutator, and this piece of wire touched the other half, then there'd be a little gap in those two halves of the commutator right there. And that's where the brushes would contact the commutator at this point. So if the brushes are in the gap, no current would be sent into the armature, and the motor would be shut off for that instant. OK, I want to take a more detailed look at this kind of situation. Uh, what we have here is we're assuming that this is basically a uniform magnetic field. But the question goes, what if the field isn't quite uniform? So um, let's scroll down and draw this one more time. So you take the same bar magnet. And truth is, from a single bar magnet like this, there is some external magnetic field line that points this way. But then the field that comes out here is going to start to curve and bend around. And as we know, all magnetic fields form closed loops. And these are going to wrap way around on themselves, pass back through the magnet, and so on. OK, now we take our loop of wire. And uh, let's say that we have just one single loop. Oop, didn't mean to do that. OK, there's our loop of wire. Now, this is a three-dimensional drawing, so let me label this. This part of the wire is in the background. So this part of the wire is in the foreground. And I'm going to imagine the case where we have current flowing, perhaps, in this direction. OK. So let's look right here at that dot 
we'd have a current that's flowing straight into the page. And at that dot, right, this current continues to flow around. Over here, the current is flowing down toward the bottom of the page. But when the current gets right here, that's a current that would be flowing out of the page. I know it's a little difficult to picture this three-dimensional scenario on a two-dimensional uh, notepad. But uh, hopefully, you follow along with me here. OK. So the magnetic field has two components to it. There's a component of the magnetic field that points to the right. We'll call that B subscript X. And there's a component to the magnetic field that points up. So we'll call that B subscript Y. Same thing over here where the current is flowing out of the page. There's a component of this magnetic field that points to the right. And there's a component to this magnetic field at this location that points down. So let's uh, try to consider the interaction of force between the components of the magnetic field and the current at each of these two locations at the top of the loop and the bottom of the loop. All right. Uh, let's see. So first, let's consider how the current and the vertical component of the magnetic field um, uh, produce an effect. So point your thumb into the page and point your fingers toward the top of the page. And I think you agree that that leads to a force that points to the right. Now let's consider the interaction between the horizontal component of the magnetic field and the current going into the page. So thumb points into the page, fingers point toward the right, and there's a force that points downward. OK. Now let's analyze the bottom portion of this loop. Point your thumb out of the page and your fingers toward the bottom of the page. Don't hurt your wrist. OK, so hopefully you agree with me that the right-hand rule suggests that would lead to a force that points to the right. And then let's consider how the horizontal component of the magnetic field and uh, it, how this horizontal component influences the current that's flowing out. So thumb out of the page, fingers to the right, and you find that there's a force that points up. So look at what the net result of all this would be. The force that points down due to the horizontal component of magnetic field and the current at the top of the loop. And then you've got this force that points up due to the horizontal component of magnetic field and the current flowing out. And those two forces would just cancel each other out. But then you're still left with a horizontal force to the right and another horizontal force to the right. So the whole net effect is that this current loop would get pushed by the external magnet to the right. Another way to look at that is to look at the magnetic dipole moment of that current loop. So what we had was a loop when viewed from the side that had a current flowing, what this person would say, the current's flowing clockwise in that loop. So if you take your right hand and you curl your fingers in this direction, then you'd find that your thumb of your right hand would point this way. So that's a right-hand rule to determine the direction of the magnetic dipole moment of a current loop. And remember, we symbolize that with the Greek letter mu. So when you have a magnetic dipole moment that points to the left, and it's influenced by an external magnetic field that points to the right, then what you have is basically opposing magnetism and it causes the two to uh, repel one another. So if the current was reversed and flowed the other way, right? if we have somebody who viewed the current and expressed it as counterclockwise when viewed from this direction, then the right-hand rule for finding magnetic dipole moment suggests mu points to the right. And then there's an external magnetic field that mostly points to the right. So those two magnetic fields point in the same direction, and you'd have attraction. Now, uh, this is all in a 
slightly non-uniform magnetic field, right? All these field lines have a component to the right, but that field curves a little bit up, this field curves a little bit down. If you had magnetic field that was pretty much entirely uniform and you have a loop in it, then there's no force to the right or force to the left as the current flows clockwise or counterclockwise. All you get is either a stretch in the loop or some compression in that loop, but no motion side to side. Well, when you dissect a speaker, you have as a big uh, dipole magnet, and the top is a north, the bottom is a south, and then there's this cone, which is really just sort of like a paper diaphragm. The key is at the bottom of this cone, there's a coil of wire. And that coil of wire is like this loop of wire that we identified. And the magnetic field is not uniform. The magnetic field curves in this manner. And so as the current is reversed uh, in this coil from an AC signal, then the coil sometimes gets pushed up sometimes gets pulled down, and it causes the whole speaker cone to vibrate up and down, and then that compresses and rarefies the air molecules and creates a sound wave. I have a video on this one. You should check out my demonstration where I've dissected a, uh, a speaker, and you can see very clearly what the effect is of the magnet on the reversing current in the speaker coil.